Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Futurama with Nerds. I'm your host, Alex Billings. With me, as always, my friend and co-host, Ryan Lecknoise. Hello. All right, and today we're going to be doing episode 401, Roswell That Ends Well. Yay! Yeah, originally aired December 9th, 2001, and was written by J. Stuart Burns. So again, we mentioned at the end of the last one, obviously we really like this one, but let's uh, get into it. Everyone really likes this one. Yeah, we can talk about how amazing it is at the end. We could <laughs> talk about how amazing it is as we go through it. Like, it's just, it hits on every level. Yeah, there are a few interesting notes to mention before we actually start the episode so it, i mean this is the season four airing premiere okay great premiere episode great finale episode either way yeah this is just an episode that fits wherever you want to be in the big stakes this episode is great this episode won an emmy for outstanding animation program in 2002 what was it for just general program outstanding animation program okay because i know they won the emmy for the color design sort of thing yeah well, I, I'm guessing this is just the top cartoon one. Because, again, it was still a technical Emmy, so it's not like the real Emmys. Yeah, but it's still, like, it makes sense that this one would win an Emmy for that as well. This is a great episode. It's strongly written. Yeah, and then there is a little uh, thing that I didn't even realize until I was researching this episode a bit, that I guess this is episode 51, which a lot of people connect to the idea of Area 51. Which makes sense, yep. Yeah. That's a neat but little thing. The only thing is they, it wasn't written as episode 51. That has to do with the reshuffling. So that actually might have been someone at Fox that was like, hey, what if we did this? It could also just end up being a crazy, crazy coincidence. For sure. Yeah. Because again, because of the reshuffling, it wasn't written as episode 51. Yeah. And I doubt someone at Fox put that much effort into reshuffling this to be episode it could, 51. It could be they suggested it. It could honestly just be like a sci-fi guy who was working it. It could also easily just be like a weird coincidence. But it, either way, it's a, a neat little tidbit of information. Yeah. So the episode opens and the crew is out in space and they've gone to watch a supernova happen. Uh, but Fry is hungry, so he was going to go make some popcorn. No, Bender says you'd be a fool to miss this. Yeah, yeah. Fry, why don't you go make us some popcorn? Right, yeah. And then Fry goes, okay, like the joke is that Bender says how great this is going to be and he immediately kicks Fry out so that he misses it. Yeah, so Bender says you'd be a fool to miss this. Yeah. Fry, go make some popcorn. Fry goes down and he has like one of those Jiffy Pops. The oven popcorn like you're supposed yeah. to do over a stovetop. Yeah, and it has a little tag on it that says, do not put in microwave, but he just yanks that off and sort of laughs and then puts it in anyways and starts it. And then immediately it starts like leaking blue color that turns everything around it blue. It's not just blue color because it smells like blue. Yeah, Fry <laughs> says, oh, it smells like blue. <laughs> and then up on the main part of the ship, the, uh, the supernova happens and it starts having this like red dome that expands out and it hits the other end of the ship. You see the blue and the red coming to meet. Everyone's screaming. Fry comes up out of the hole and he's like, hey, what weird thing happened are you guys screaming about? And then the two things meet and they get sucked into like a vortex, which I got to say, I like, I'll mention it again later. The visuals in this episode are great. The animation, like the, the supernova is super great. The two colors meeting was really good. Oh, it's a great, like you're the watching tunnel. this to start. You're like, oh, this is like a budget. Like it's definitely doesn't have any different of a budget, but you can like, oh, this I looks don't know. like a high budget episode. It might've been because they did know from the start this was going to be an important episode so they might have been willing to put the budget in and you know they're going through the tunnel they have the whole thing where like their calendar is going backwards and then you see a bunch of clocks yeah i don't know what happened but we've taken on a lot of clocks yeah yeah and they come out and yeah lila says that because everyone's all worried but they're just in space everything seems fine yeah so they go back to earth and they're like there's it's weird there's no traffic around earth and professor like and what's this layer of ozone that's never been there before. All of a sudden, the global positioning system starts acting up. Yeah, there's no GPS. I like how they don't say GPS, though. They say global positioning system. Yeah, and all the alarms start going off. And they're like, we're going to crash. And they're like, not if I can help it. And she's like, oh, wait, I can't. And then just let's go. Which <laughs> is weird, because she can't just pilot it down. No, she's like, oh, I can't. Put on your seatbelts. Yeah, and everyone puts them on. And Bender's like, those things cost more lives than they save. And they crash. And he goes flying out the window. Yeah. So they go looking for Bender. And they find him out in a field all broken to pieces. And they're like, oh, God, Bender, are you okay? And he's like, I don't know. I'm trying to move my legs. And then you see his leg unattached, still moving. And Leela has the, all right, here's the plan. Swordberg, you pick up all the pieces. The rest of us take five. Yeah, that's great too. And then Swordberg like uses Bender's arm as like a grabber, starts picking it up. So they all go back and then it cuts to like nighttime. He's still picking up the pieces. It's like Zoidberg picks up another piece and the crowd goes wild. Yeah, he like turns into a little game for himself. Yeah. And then a bunch of like cars pull up and he's like in the headlights. He's just like, huh? But then it cuts back to the rest of them on the ship and the professor realizes they've, oh no, he doesn't realize it right away. Yeah, he does. So he says that the whatever they use to track the time puts them at 1947. And he knows that because the time thing has turned into a, this pinup calendar. But before that, there's it continues with Zoidberg, actually. 
where he gets taken in and then we see the military base and there's two generals and the one's like sir with all my years of covering things with white sheets and revealing them this is the biggest and like the debris of an alien spacecraft and pulls it up and it's all benders part he's like dun 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 and then the other general is like well i think i speak for all of earth when i go ah! yeah 1947 will be a great year for roswell new mexico because yeah, that's the big reveal yeah and that's the commercial break right there yeah and they talk about how this is the first time travel episode and they had decided early on they didn't want time travel to be a big thing. Which I agree with, even though it happens more than you would think it's in this show. It's happened a few times now as it's gone on, but they said they didn't want to introduce it early on for sure. I mean, this ended up being earlier than they even said I they mean, originally did. They didn't want to introduce it early on outside of the fried time travel into the future well, that's, thing. That is and isn't time travel, though. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. Like, they're not going back in time and all that. Well, he's not even moving through time. He's cryogenically freezing himself. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, they're like, obviously, they're very happy with this one. It was a very solid episode they wanted to keep time travel to be something rare though and that's why they even made it it had to be the supernova yeah and the thing so it's like it wasn't something they could just recreate all the time but yeah they're like well if they can time travel it's like why don't they just solve everything with time travel but yeah then we go back to the ship and the professor realizes because he's yeah their yeah. their calendars now become a pinup calendar and it's set to that date it's uh july 9th 1947 yeah, which is the Roswell, New Mexico stuff. Yes. And then they realize that they're the UFO that crashed. Again, like, then having the alien they captured was, was, and it cuts back and there's like a big box and they open it up and Zoidberg's inside. He's like, hello. <laughs> what are you guys doing later tonight? <laughs> I'm up for whatever. Yeah. I think we also established that they only have 24 hours to get back yes. through the wormhole. Professor explains, yeah, like it opened a hole, but it's clenching tight quickly. So they have exactly 24 hours and they're like going to go out and him and Leela have to go get a microwave because they need a microwave to recreate the issue. Yeah. So like, oh, that should be easy enough yeah. to find. Let's and go theirs, buy a microwave. Yeah. Theirs was destroyed. And then I like that they send Bender and Fry because they have Bender's head still. Yeah. They send Bender and Fry like go rescue Bender's body from the thing. No one mentioned Zoidberg. Nope. It's not even a joke. He's just not mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> just like... In this entire episode, they never mentioned Zoidberg. They just don't care if they get him or not. Yeah. Yeah. And as, as Fry's going, he said, oh, great. I'll go visit my great uncle or my grandpa Enos because he was stationed at Roswell. Yeah. And then the professor's like, dear God, Fry. It's like, you can't talk to your grandfather. It's like, if, he, if you were to kill him, he'd, you'd cease to exist. It's like, you can't do anything that affects anything unless it turns out you were supposed to do it. In which case, for God's sakes, don't not do it. Yeah. Fry's just like, got it. He yeah. starts to like panic a little bit because like, well, he's like, you'll cease to exist. He's like, Existing's all I do. <laughs> yeah. So he's like already a little bit worried that he can't have Enos die. Yeah. Because again, he's an idiot and doesn't realize that if he just doesn't affect things, then Enos won't die. But again, he's an idiot. So he thinks he has to protect them. Yeah. Well, they all go to go out and uh, we see President Truman coming to the base now to come see everything that's happening. And they like bring him in. They like sneak him in. And it's like a box of canned eggs. And he just like busts out. <laughs> it was a pretty good scene. And he's like, gentlemen, it's like I've gathered the top generals, some scientists. And one conspiracy, not that no one will believe. And he, the guy, like, takes a picture, and it's, like, the... I guess it's a picture from the 1997 Arizona UFOs. Like, it's a copy of that. Yeah, well, he takes multiple pictures. Well, he only does two, honestly. I thought it was more when I was remembering, but yeah. Is it just that and the Nessie one? Yeah. Oh. But he does that, and then, yeah, they take Truman in to meet Zoidberg. And I really like they have him... They go in, like, an office with him, and he's at a desk, and Truman's like, If you're here to make peace, surrender or be destroyed. If you're here to make war... We surrender. <laughs> so I was like, either options are good, but what's important is that I'm meeting new people. Yeah, like, he's just like immediately like, we'll surrender. <laughs> yeah, then they decide they're going to do an autopsy on him and like someone pulls out a saw and so Edward's just like, hooray! Well, first they, they have this experiment where they want to see what oh, right. he eats and so Edward just comes out of a room to a buffet and he goes, a buffet? If only I brought my wallet. <laughs> Yeah, and then they cut in on his voicing. Uh, it's free, and they just hear him, Rawr! and food starts splattering against the window, and then he just shoots onto it. This is one of the best Zoidberg episodes yeah. by far. <laughs> like sucking the juice off the window. <laughs> yeah, and then, yeah, they decide that they need to do an autopsy since they're not getting anything out of talking to Zoidberg. Yeah, and Zoidberg's like, hooray, as they pull the, uh, the saw out. Because again, he's just interacting with people. He's just so happy to be involved. Yeah, people are interested in him. This is great. Yeah, we see Fry go to the military base with Bender's head. And they're like looking for his body, I guess. And we see him walking in, and he hears someone yell, Enos. So it's his grandfather. Well, this is where we get the play on Hogan's Heroes is what this yeah, is. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Or I think they said it was a private pile or something. Okay. Yeah, and it's, you know, the sergeant tells Enos to prepare his, or clean the latrines good enough that he could eat off them and then prepare his lunch and serve them in the latrines. So Enos goes to walk and he's like crossing a little street, like dirt road. And Fry sees a Jeep down the way and he's like, oh no, that Jeep's going to hit him. I'll stop existing. He runs up and like pushes him. And you just, I love that shot where you see the Jeep still coming so slowly and then still turns off way before it even gets to where he was. Oh yeah, it's not even close. Like he pushes him three seconds before, like it's so good. No, not even three seconds. It would have been like another minute before 
before it got to where Enos was. But it turns off the road before it even gets there anyway. It's so very clear that Enos was in no danger at all. Yeah, and Fry's like, ah, you gotta watch out. You almost died. And he's like, oh, well, thank you. I guess I'm lucky you pushed me onto this pile of rusty bayonets. Yeah. And then he's like, anyways, I gotta go make Sarge's lunch. Handling raw chicken, best part of the job. It's finger looking good. And Fry's like, it's too dangerous here. We gotta get you out of here. He grabs him, like, runs away. And they go into town, and they're walking through town there's you know a few shots there but enos is like got any snacks in that lunchbox i'm getting hungry and he reaches into bender's head and pulls out a bunch of microchips and starts eating them yeah essentially this is where we realize where fry gets his stupidity from yeah enos is real dumb well like enos and fry definitely are very similar enos is probably more dumb than Fry. he's definitely more dumb than fry but like you can see the like oh that's where because we've seen fry's family before this his parents yeah his parents are not like fry the professor is not like fry yancey is not really that much like fry so you're like where does he get all this stuff from and so yeah but he's like oh those crackers cut my mouth up something off let's stop off for a malt so they go into a malt shop whatever happened to malt shop i mean it's just a diner yeah but yeah and then the waitress comes to take their order and Enos is like you see that waitress over there and fry's like oof i know what i want for dessert that's my girlfriend mildred he's like grandma mildred <laughs> and she walks over he's like no dessert for me thanks yeah and then he's like oh she's real pretty you better marry her and father some children right away and it's like yeah people keep saying that you get the feeling you only go with girls because you're supposed to and fry just has like a moment of silence and he's like what don't ever ever say or think that again yeah which is great because fry is obviously not against gay people but it's just if his grandfather ends up being gay he won't exist yeah again it's very clear which i liked about this episode that he's not homophobic and never comes off homophobic it all comes off as fear for his own existence yeah yeah and you know he's still just afraid of everything so like the fry cooks grilling a little fire spatters up like they do on grills and he's like look out fire and he like pushes the table over and a knife slides down and lands right between enos's legs and he's like oh god i almost neutered you and he's like well taint as bad as getting killed like, for me it is like there's that one point before they leave the army base too, where he like yells at Enos's crotch saying, don't worry, dad, I'll keep you safe. Yeah, he's basically just still worried. So he grabs Enos and he takes him out to the middle of nowhere, like some cabin. He's like, all right, you just stay here and enjoy this calendar. And he has the pinup calendar from the ship with like the the woman on it. And Enos like lifts it up and there's a guy on the next month. And Fry just, I love the way Fry stares at him angrily and just turns it back down. <laughs> like, no, this is really good. Uh, they were saying in the commentary, they're like, who was this calendar made for? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but then Fry is driving away. And he's still got like Bender's head with him. He's like, all right, he'll be safe there. Everything will be fine. And he drives by a sign that says like atomic testing site. An atomic testing in progress. Yeah. So then an atomic bomb goes off and like the follow comes and it just like wipes out the whole building. And Fry and Bender are there looking at it in the rear view mirror, which again, this is actually another moment of like great animation. Like the mushroom cloud is really good. And then when they're driving away, there's a thing where you see the mushroom cloud in the rear view mirror and you can still see the ground moving by stuff like that then bender's just like and you are out of here and then that's like the next commercial break when it comes back we have the professor and leela they're going to like an appliance store to go buy a microwave and they're in like she's in like a poodle skirt and everything and the professor's in like a zoot suit like they're trying to dress like the 50s but they went for the most stereotypical dress you could yeah it's a good little joke too it's like they're not wrong but at the same time they're not right yeah it's again it's like a caricature from that time but it's the same thing like if you if we were just to go back to like Victorian England, we would dress in like the big wigs and all that stuff. Like most people didn't wear that stuff. Most people were just wearing like rags. <laughs> yeah. Leela's saying, she's like, Fry's from this time. I'll talk like him. She goes up to the salesman. Like, hey, Holmes. <laughs> yeah. Yo, Holmes. We need a microwave. Yeah, he's like, microwave, never heard of that brand. It's like, here, you need this oven right here. It's like, look at it, it's super fast. It's got a fold-out ironing board and a uh, foot-soaking tub at the bottom. Since as a woman, you'll be standing in front of it all day. And Leela just opens the thing and lands on his knee. He's like, look, we need a microwave. And then the guy looks at the professor. He's like, sir, your wife's hysterical, so I'm going to talk to you. This baby is lightning fast. It'll cook a roast in five hours. And the professor, like, leans over. He's like, oh, that's good news. You know, you don't make enough roasts, Leela. <laughs> turns the burner on that lights his fire his tie on fire professor looks like women <laughs> so essentially this is where we realize like microwaves have not been well, invented exactly. in 1947 so not like at least for personal use yeah right? so where are they going to get a microwave oven sort of thing is the so problem. they go they go to the diner now and they're like going to order food like mildred comes up professor's like i'll have some soylent green with a side of soylent coleslaw coleslaw and a soylent coke soylent orange juice <laughs> or soylent orange juice she's like what and then it was like professor we're in the 20th century he's like all right i'll have a croque masseur and something else which I think our foods from now, they're just very fancy foods. Yeah, he got, he went with super fancy stuff. Yeah, and then Leela's like, and I'll just have a small injection of Femma Slim. And Mildred's like, two chili dogs, <laughs> and walks away. And they're like sitting there like, what are we going to do? And then Leela sees a, a satellite dish at the military base. She's like, wait a minute, that's a microwave satellite. We can use that. And the professor's like, no, it's our destiny not to interfere with the past. He's like, oh God, we'll have to endure the music of the big, big bopper and then the tragedy of his death. <laughs> and then Fry just walks in and goes, well, my grandfather's dead. <laughs> yeah, and they're like, what? How are you still alive? He's like, I don't know. Maybe God loves me. And then Benner just 
laughs out loud. <laughs> I, just, like, I just love how he just walks in. Well, killed my grandfather. And then we see Mildred on like the payphone. She's like, he's dead? It's like, oh. And she starts crying. She's like, no, I'm sorry. I don't take much solace in the fact that the ignition system worked perfectly. And Fry comes up. He's like, hey, it's okay. His body was vaporized. So there's no chance of him coming back as a zombie. She's like, I'm not worried about that. He's like, then you're a braver woman than I. And she's like, I just feel so lonely. It's like, would you walk me home? And I like, she's like uh, how far is it? Yeah, she goes, you remind me of Venus. You mind walking me home? Yeah. And then he takes her to, like, an apartment building, and they go in, and she's still upset. Like, Fry looks so, like, plain through this whole thing. Like, he just doesn't care, but he's, like, hits his grandmother, so he feels like he has to be nice. Yeah. And then she's like, everything reminds me of Venus. And she picks up a picture of a mushroom cloud, <laughs> like a framed picture on her table. Yeah. And she, like, leans in, and she's like, oh, hold me. Oh, you like holding me, don't you? And he starts shaking. Jumps up, and he's like, he's like, you know what always makes you feel better? You're making me a big tray of cookies. And she's like, how about these cookies, sugar? And, like, rips her shirt open. He's like, oh, God, I can't do this. It's like, you're my grandma. But I shouldn't even exist. Which means you can't be my real grand. And she starts it's like making out the with him is, and he goes for it. That's actually pretty good logical thinking by Fry. I was thinking about that. It's like on the, the side of biological, yes. Yeah. But he still grew up with her as his grandma. It'd be like if you grew up with an adopted parent and be like, well, they're not my real parent, so I can sleep with them. You're not wrong. But at the same time, like I see your point. But in his point, he's like, there must be a mistake. This Mildred can't be my grandmother. There must yeah. be somebody else but who's again, my grandmother. Imagine if you grew up with your grandmother, then met the young her and were like, even if she wasn't your grandmother, wouldn't you still be like, no, that's still my grandma. Yeah. <laughs> like, Yeah. I, I know what you're saying, but like, this is still a pretty good no, I, logical thought by Fry to be like, she actually can't have been, well, because his thought is she can't have been the grandma that I grew up with because the grandma I grew up with has to still exist right now with the grandpa. So like the, the person I thought with Enos and the fiance I thought was Mildred were the wrong people. Maybe. Is essentially the logic he's coming to. Like my grandfather and my grandmother are here, but I just didn't meet them. These were different human beings and they have to be because I'm still alive. Maybe. My thought would have been he would think he was adopted or something or his father was adopted. Or... But yeah, so they, they cut to the next morning and Fry's like in bed with her and... He goes, don't worry, it's okay, she's not my grandmother. Well, yeah, Leela, the professor, and Bender are in the window, and they're like, oh, appalled, and they're like, knocking the window, and Fry gets up, and like, what did you do? <laughs> yeah, and he's, he's like, don't worry, I figured it out. She can't be my real grandma, and Fry's the professor like, of course she's your grandmother, you idiot, and he looks back, and now she's got, like, the little glasses and her hair in a bun, and she's, like, knitting, and she's like, come back to bed, dearie. <laughs> yeah. And Fry's like, oh, God, then who's my grandfather? And the professor's like, isn't it obvious? And he's like, what? You are. <laughs> Which is great. <laughs> yeah, and Fry, like, screams, and they have Mildred be like, I'm sorry, did you say something? I'm Hard of hearing, she pulls like one of those giant horns to like listen. But she ages real quickly. So then they get him back on the ship and they're like, Leela discovers she saw the microwave antenna earlier when we were in the yeah. diner and she's like, We can just steal that thing. Well, yeah, they're let's go get it. And Fry's like, I thought we couldn't change the past. And Professor's like, Oh, a lesson from not changing the past for Mr. I'm my own grandpa. Screw the past. Let's go home. And they just go full tilt, like military style. They start blowing up the base in the spaceship, yeah. shooting everything up. They do have a part where they're doing the autopsy on Zoidberg. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're like opening him up and they're pointing out like there's two guys and they're recording like the heart and he's like, take it. I have five and like stomach contents, one deviled egg. They put it on a tray and then it's over like a deviled egg and he like sucks it down and they're like the same deviled egg. And then, yeah, that then the attack comes and they're yeah blowing everything up. They're they attacking. don't care about past consequences anymore. They're just getting the, what they want and getting the hell out. Yeah, they use, like, the winch to steal the, the satellite, and the professor goes in on a little hover recliner chair and, like, shoots the wall open and steals Bender's body pieces back, which they've reconstructed into, like, a little UFO. Yeah. Fry and Leela are going in for Zoidberg, and Zoidberg's in there first, and the guy's, like, sawing something. He's like, wait, don't cut that. I need that to speak. And then, like, Truman and the two guys all leaning closer, and they start cutting faster. <laughs> yeah, they bust in with jetpacks, and Leela, like, kicks the two guys, and then Fry starts pulling organs out of Zoidberg and throwing them at the, <laughs> the president. He's like, take this, Mr. President, sir. And one hits him in the face and so everybody's like the president's gagging on my gas bladder what an honor <laughs> yeah they get him out and they're all up in the ship they do like the some world war ii era planes chase them but they get off and they shoot up into space and they're about to do it and they still have the bottom open from the winch and uh bender's like ha 1947 can kiss my shiny metal hey ah, falls out his head falls out. yeah just the head and fry's like Lila, turn around we gotta go back for bender and the professor's like there's no time the wormhole's clenching shut if we don't go now we'll never make it back and fry like screams no and they do it and they go through and they get back to the year 3000 and they go back to planet express and zoidberg's like taping himself shut he's like there good as new and then Lila's like don't you need this one and holds up an organ he's like oh no that's my and falls over pops up he's like gotcha 
<laughs> he has so many useless organs. Yeah. Fry's like, man, poor Bender, sitting there alone for a thousand years. And like, wait a minute. And they cut to them going back to Roswell. And they have a metal detector. And they find his head. They dig him up. And like, Bender, what was it like sitting there for a thousand years? I was enjoying it till you came along. And they put his head back on like the UFO body and like flies away. And like, let's go home. And that's the end of the episode. This is such a good episode. This is an amazing episode. This is by far to me the best of the original run. Oh, yeah. Like, again, from our top five, I think we technically listed it as two. There's one in the new run that I think is they're basically on par. I think depending on the day, I could put either of them as my favorite. Yeah. They're like this episode is pretty much perfect. Like I have no complaints. It's visually stunning. It's greatly written. It's easily one of the funniest it's episodes. Very funny. Like there's there's no bad points to this one. I love they do like an interesting color palette to make it look like the fifties and feel that way. And I know we've talked before, sometimes a bad color palette can like kind of ruin the episode, but this one's like a good one that like gives it this new energy. Every single joke lands. Even like we're watching this for how like the millionth time at this point, and it's still funny watching it. You're still enjoying it. Like I get gave this episode a 96 i just 100 i just went for it that's fair it's perfect i can't like i legitimately i couldn't come up with a complaint my only thought going in was like part of me was like i wonder if like maybe the gay jokes didn't age well because that could definitely be an issue but they do it in a way that it works because it never comes off as homophobic it comes out as fry being scared for his own existence exactly that's why it still works. Yeah. Like this is, I, I think a hundred is fair. Like I gave it a 96 because I'm not on a hundred level type person, but like, I know part of me was like, should I do a 99? But it's like, I just, if, if you're doing a 99, you might as well do a hundred. This episode is incredible. Like it was really hard picking a favorite joke. For yeah. This one. I, I have two. I couldn't narrow it down. I did the whole Zordberg. The important thing is I'm meeting new people, but in general, the entirety of Zordberg yeah. with the people, like when he just first shows up and he's supposed to be like this scary alien stuff. And he's just in the cage. He's like, hello like what are you guys doing tonight because i'm up for any like he's just so happy to be included yeah normally no one wants to spend time with zoidberg yeah and again the fact that the the crew never even mentions that he's gone they just don't care i love that because it's it's not even a joke that's written in it's just they're gonna get the microwave fry and bender are gonna get bender's body and then they're gonna leave yeah like, <laughs> what about Zorbuk? We don't like it's, it's so irrelevant to them. Yeah, I I ended up with two, and they're both professor moments. And it's uh the first one is when he's talking to Fry, and he's like, "Don't do anything that affects anything, unless it turns out you are supposed to do it." Then, in which case, for God's sakes, don't not do it. Yeah, which technically Fry did. Yeah, because he was supposed to be his own grandfather, hence his ability to fight the brains. Yeah, and then uh the other one is at the end when he's like, oh, a lesson in not changing the past from Mr. I'm my own grandpa. I was going to say, I do like how this, the episode wraps up with the professor just being so mad at Fry that he says, screw content. I don't care anymore. Let's just leave. We're doing this. It's like, it reminds me so much of like, obviously this predates the hot tub time machine, but it's the same idea of this new future trope where it's like, who cares? No, you're in the past. Just affect the past. Let's go. Who cares about any of this? But I just, I like how the professor is so against it. And then Fry does something. He's just like, screw it. I don't care anymore. Yeah. Like there's, there's no bad bad scenes in the episode like everything is great yeah there, like you said every joke lands like i can't think of an attempt at a joke that fell flat this episode is like it's one of the episodes that keeps this show getting renewed because the fans think about this one they think about a handful of others that are like no we we need more of this and i'm hoping the second half of season 11 when it comes out gives us something like this yeah now asking them to create something on this level is asking a lot that's the thing yeah i mean obviously again like i said i consider this like the perfect episode of futurama it's it is definitely it's it's uh it's an incredible episode it's yeah. important to the it's important to the lore of the whole franchise That's it's right. funny it's got great like it's so well written like it's got everything you could ask for from episode it's just so good yeah it's the whole thing of why fry has the delta brain or doesn't have the delta brain which is interesting because i don't think that was actually planned because again they didn't plan to do a time travel episode so i don't know how they originally were gonna work out the brain thing but the thing is now in theory he always had to have been his own grandpa because that's why he doesn't have it and he already didn't have it but they were talking about when they were writing this episode like trying to do the math and they're like technically we don't know where he got his y chromosome from like originally because they're like if enos isn't his grandfather's like he did he get it from himself and it's like it doesn't really make sense because it's also his father's father too so it's like that's the side you have to get the y chromosome yeah, from it's the barry allen loop of him being the lightning bolt that caused his own powers to be the lightning bolt that caused his own powers to be the lightning bolt that caused his own powers. yeah it would have to be that and they said they were trying to mathematically figure out how his genetics would work and they said originally they thought it would be 50 percent mildred 25 percent each of the other grandparents but they said no the only way it works is that it's closer to a third of each grandparent but yeah they were because they were obviously they're like it doesn't really work but the closest you could 
can figure out would be a third of each grandparent. Yeah, it does. It, it, it can't work. It you can't give yourself a quarter of your own genetic material. Yeah, it doesn't work. And, and still be a functioning human being. <laughs> but yeah, hopefully everyone will be back to join us next week when we review A Tale of Two Santas. Another really good one. Another great one. Not quite as good as this one, but you're going to be hard pressed to find one as good as this one. No, so. this, like, I might end up having some more personal favorites that go above a 96, but those will honestly be bias picks. Like, yeah. thinking about this from, like, an objective view, this is definitely a top two episode. Oh, yeah. Like you're saying, the other one, which I know we'll get to eventually, is on par with this, if not better, but this is still, like, this is a, an incredible episode. Yeah, absolutely. And there, there is one more episode that you don't like, which most other fans like. Well, you do like it, but it's you don't like it as much as this one but other fans will argue is great we'll get to it when we get to it all right all right see you all next time